Morning everybody, David Shapiro here with another video. Today's video is going to be a bit of a doozy. So we're talking about the singularity and in particular the singularity endgame. Namely that there are four potential likely outcomes. There's quite a few more than these four, um, but these are the easiest ones to talk about. Um, so those four are utopia, dystopia, collapse, and extinction. So let's go ahead and get started. Actually, I lied. Before we get started, I just want to plug my Patreon real quick. Um, I've had uh, tremendous growth in uh, subscriber support, so I've actually had to put a cap on the higher tiers because I only have so many hours in a day. Um, so if you want to jump in on my Patreon, there are lower tiers if you just want to be a sustainer or chat with me via Patreon. But if you want to jump in and have uh, Zoom calls, uh, I schedule those via Calendly, and I'm happy to jump in and talk about whatever you want to talk about within reason, obviously. All right, so right back to the show. Introduction. What are we talking about? Let's define some terms. So first, we need to talk about the concept of global attractor states. So a global attractor state is a long-term scenario or, or outcome for the, the entirety of humanity. Um, it is characterized by specific trends and factors. Um, the ones that I chose for this video are quality of life, population, stability, and sustainability. Um, these attractor states are uh, driven by certain factors and macroeconomic forces, um, such as technology. We'll get into the details in a minute. Um, it is also influenced by the choices, the collective choices of individuals, corporations, nations, and so on. Um, and these will serve as uh, a framework for exploring this, uh, this concept. So the four basic attractor states that I talked about, or uh, singularity outcomes, are utopia, dystopia, collapse, and extinction. So utopia, in terms of the dimensions that I just mentioned, uh, characterized by high quality of life, sustainability, global cooperation, yada, 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 you get it. Dystopia is pretty much the opposite of utopia, uh, low quality of life, um, high or unstable population, widespread instability, so on and so forth. Now collapse is another possibility where uh, the quality of life rapidly uh, declines as well as the population, and this could be due to extreme amounts of failure or other problems that arise such as uh, ecological collapse, global conflict, and so on. And then finally, extinction is where, for whatever reason, uh, humanity goes extinct. Now, this could be that the Earth becomes uninhabitable due to extreme climate change, nuclear war, runaway AGI, all sorts of things. There's several existential threats that we are aware of. And of course, there's natural existential threats like a you know comet strike or something. So the, me the dimensions that I mentioned... Um, because we want to be scientific about this and approach it in something that's actually measurable. Um, number one is quality of life, which encompasses the overall well-being, happiness, and personal satisfaction of all individuals on the planet, um, which can be measured by proxies such as uh, health, education, economic opportunities, uh, and the other measurements like Gini coefficient, equality, so on and so forth. Um, population is another good metric because, uh, obviously in the, in the case of collapse or extinction, you see the population fall off a cliff, um, in many dystopic, uh, outcomes, you might expect the population to e climb to unsustainable levels, which could then be followed, uh, by a collapse. Um, it could also, you could also see an unstable population where we become overpopulated and due to overcrowding and uh, breakdown of systems, the population declines significantly, not necessarily a collapse, and then it comes back. We want to avoid that as well. We want nice, stable, sustainable population. And of course, finally, uh, overall global stability and sustainability. So this includes uh, geopolitical uh, stability, environmental sustainability, uh, resilience, balance, and so on. So those are the three primary dimensions that we're going to be looking at while we evaluate these uh, attractor states or the singularity outcomes that we're looking at. All right, so let's take a closer look at each of those four states. So state one, utopia. This is the one that we all want. Um, so utopia is defined by a high quality of life, 
um, which can be characterized by high levels of well-being, happiness, and satisfaction for everyone, not just a few people, everyone. Um, I just mentioned that the population should be sustainable, um, which also impl uh, implies a stable population. Um, you don't want demographic uh, collapses. You don't want uh, population decline due to famine, war, and so on and so forth. Uh, utopia is also defined by stability and sustainability. So this includes economic sustainability, uh, geopolitical stability, uh, so on and so forth. Um, it goes well above and beyond climate change, right? It's got to be um, global stability in pretty much every way that you can measure that. So some of the key factors that will help us achieve utopia could be technological breakthroughs like uh, sustainable energy, artificial intelligence, which is happening right now, um, global cooperation, and then also um, cultural and social shifts because we do have some, some really destructive tendencies right now. State number two is dystopia, which is what a lot of people are afraid that we're heading towards. Um, so dystopia is uh, characterized by a low quality of life, um, such as limited access to basic needs and resources, widespread suffering, unhappiness, and general dissatisfaction with life. Uh, potentially high population, so overcrowding could result in a dystopic outcome, or it could be a contributing factor. Um, but also, it's, Im it's important to keep in mind that uh, lower population, if not a population collapse, could also be part of, of a dystopia because people are just too unhappy, too unwell, and too poor to have children. Um, <clears throat> uh, another uh, feature of a dystopian outcome would be instability and unsustainability. So dystopia could very quickly lead to collapse due to instability or unsustainability, but it could also lead to a, uh, a pullback where the population declines uh, such that stability returns due to lack of competition. Um, so some of the key factors that could lead to dystopia, number one is unchecked corporatism, um, social and economic inequality, authoritarianism, um, and then finally, unmitigated nihilism and intergenerational PTSD, uh, which are as yet unsolved problems. State number three, collapse. So collapse is what is, uh, some people are more afraid of, and that is that uh, because of ongoing instability and environmental change, we might end up with very, very precipitous drops in quality of life as well as significant population loss. So this is portrayed in TV shows like The Walking Dead um, and movies like Mad Max, um, where basically there's only a few humans left after the collapse. And we're talking less than 5% of the current population, but as low as like 0.1% of the population. So in, in the case of total infrastructure breakdown due to an unraveling of social fabric, most people starve to death just due to lack of infrastructure. If we run out of fuel and um, international trade, uh, basically farms fail and then most people starve. Um, so collapse is actually a lot higher of a risk than you might think because of how fragile uh, logistical chains are. And then finally, state four is extinction. Um, this is a, a stable outcome because if humans are gone, they're not coming back. Um, and then, of course, there's a few ways to achieve this. Um, not that we want to, but nuclear war, nuclear holocaust could do that. Runaway AGI or total uh, ecological collapse could make the earth completely uninhabitable to humans. Um, and in that case, the viability of the planet uh, is called into question um, not just for humans, but many other animals. In general, uh, you know, the planet has survived uh, mass extinctions in the past, um, but that doesn't preclude the possibility of another mass extinction in the future, which would in which could very well include us, and it could be um, self-inflicted. Okay, so I've painted a nice rosy picture. We've only got one desirable outcome and three really undesirable outcomes. So what are the primary drivers and factors behind these? I already outlined some of the dimensions that we're measuring, but that's not, what's the, that's not what the, uh, the causes are. So there are six overall uh, drivers and factors that I identified. So first is technological advancements. So technology is always a double-edged sword. Look at nuclear energy. 
If you harness nuclear energy responsibly, you get nuclear reactors, you get thorium, you get mol uh, not molten salts, uh, nuclear fusion, so on and so forth. Now, the same exact technology can be used to make weapons. Um, so uh, nuclear energy is a perfect example of how uh, disruptive technologies are always a double-edged sword. It is not that a technology is intrinsically um, evil, it is how we choose to use it. So that can go either way. Uh, factor number two is geopolitics. So this includes um, international trade, globalism, deglobalism, uh, as well as uh, trends on the, on the global stage such as uh, authoritarianism, surveillance, uh, liberalization of democracies, um, and then of course uh, cooperate, global cooperation or a lack thereof. Uh, factor number three is economic policy. Um, which this has to do with economic institutions um, as well as just individual economic and fiscal policy. So what I mean by that is uh, we have institutions like the IMF, the World Bank, there's uh, groups like Davos, uh, G20, G8, World Economic Forum. So that is where global policy is set, um, but then local uh, economic policy is decided on an, on a uh, nation by nation and state by state basis, which that includes everything from you know taxation and wealth redistribution all the way up to how much uh, influence corporations are allowed to have, and then of course those macroeconomic decisions made in the halls of power. Uh, number four is environmental management. So this is pretty obvious. Basically, climate change. Do we do something about it? Yes or no. Do we clean up the oceans? Do we adopt sustainable farming practices? Do we continue deforestation? Um, that is, uh, again, that, that can easily go either way. It is entirely up to us how we treat the environment. Um, societal values, so I already mentioned things like uh, nihilism, um, but there's also other factors such as do we invest in empathy and equity and uh, emotional sustainability of the world? And then finally, um, nihilism. We live in an age of nihilism, which is caused by and results in violence, despair, and uh, cynicism. Um, and it is a vicious cycle. It is a self-perpetuating loop. And we'll talk more about all of these right now. So factor one, technology. Um, obviously, top of mind right now is artificial intelligence with the rapid uh, rise of autonomous AI systems. Um, and we are barreling towards AGI, which is a critical component of the singularity. Uh, again, like all technologies, it's a double-edged sword. It has more to do with how we implement it rather than any intrinsic motivation of these technologies. We can build AGI to be like nuclear weapons, or we can build AGI to be like nuclear power. It can be harmful. It can be helpful. It can be both. It can be neither, depending on how we implement it. Renewable energy will be another huge factor, um, whether that's solar, fusion, thorium, molten salts, wind, whatever, um, even, even uh, green-ish green, green forms of energy uh, could be, uh, or, or renewables, right, um, such as uh, harvesting trees and burning them, right, because then the, you plant more trees and they pull the carbon right back out of the air. Um, biotechnology. So biotech includes genetics, protein medicine, life extension, um, cloning, organ replacement, uh, as well as farming and agriculture. But I did split these up because agricultural technologies go above and beyond biotechnology. So vertical farming, genetic engineering of crops, regenerative uh, agriculture practices um, will be absolutely critical to figure out um, in order to create a sustainable population um, either as the population grows or as the climate changes. Um, but basically, we need more resilient food uh, sources. Factor two is geopolitics, so global governance. Now, this doesn't mean a one-world government, but global governance means uh, cooperation and collaboration between all governments, which we are trending in that direction, with the exception of Britain leaving the EU, which everyone is very happy to remind me that I got that wrong when I implied that Britain was part of the EU, they are not right now. I hope they will rejoin. Um, another uh, aspect of geopolitics is democracy versus authoritarianism. Um, this is kind of the theme of the last century or so. 
um, uh, in terms of global war, which is uh, ideological incompatibilities. Um, it was with World War One and Two. That was between that was in and amongst Europe. Uh, fortunately, Europe by and large has unified around liberal democracy. Now the uh, and so that was you know fascism versus you know freedom, and then it became um, you know American versus Soviet, and now it's by and large East versus West. Um, and so that is a, a contest that has yet to be resolved, and it could take many, many more decades for it to be resolved. Uh, both China and Russia, um, which are the primary authoritarian regimes that remain, have both tried to liberalize, but they are so corrupt and a number of other problems that they have kind of backpedaled in the last few years. Um, nationalism and populism, these are other factors that can contribute to um, internal strife, um, civil unrest within nations, um, and basically, well, they're entirely too large to unpack. Um, but some of the things that can result is uh, political uh, polarization, isolationism, trade wars, um, and so on. And of course, if a nation is internally less effective, it will be uh, less of a player on the global stage. Um, and could even become uh, an agent of chaos. And then finally, conflict and diplomacy. See above statements. Uh, factor number three is economic policy. So uh, to dive a little bit deeper into this, um, uh, concepts such as wealth distribution, uh, which right now we are becoming increasingly unequal in terms of distribution. Uh, wealth is concentrating at the top, which this goes through patterns in history. Um, so it has reset many times throughout history. Um, hopefully we can have a wealth reset without violence or collapse. Um, in the case of the Roman Republic, uh, transitioning to the Roman Empire, wealth continued accumulating in the upper echelons of Rome until it was so unbalanced that it contributed to the collapse of the Roman Empire. Um, and that was just due to systemic failures, institutional failures. Uh, number two is corporate influence. So as I have mentioned in many videos, corporations are intrinsically amoral. The only thing that they desire is more income, and they will optimize their strategy around income. Um, now, that means that they have to play nice in terms of regulations and not abusing their employees too much, but uh, corporations want power, they want more power, they want more money, and they will stop at nothing to do that. And so if we do not rein corporations in, we will end up with a situation where corporations have far more influence than voters, which there are many people that argue that they already do. Um, whether or not you believe that corporations have more influence than voters, they already have too much influence overall in order to achieve a stable outcome. Fiscal policy has to do with taxation. I already mentioned that. Um, so taxation, redistribution, um, and also how things are allocated. So this has to do with the philosophy of how much do we tax and where do we spend that tax money? Um, that has a huge impact on these outcomes. And then finally, sustainable development. Um, this, in, this includes um, using economic policy to incentivize stability and sustainability, which by and large, a lot of governments are moving in this direction. The question is whether or not they're moving fast enough. So whether you get rid of oil subsidies, you create solar subsidies, or you subsidize research, of a certain kind, uh, governments have the ability to incentivize the behaviors that they want to see and push people towards more sustainable development. And again, this is happening all over the place, um, including incentivizing sustainable ho uh, home building practices by, you know, for instance, in, uh, requiring an increase of insulation quality. Uh, it also has to do with setting standards for, for automobiles. So for the longest time, they set targets for uh, fuel efficiency in cars. And now, of course, many governments are setting targets to get rid of uh, petro uh, petroleum burning cars altogether. Those are examples of how economic policy can influence the outcomes that we're talking about here. Factor number four, environmental sustainability. So this goes a lot uh, beyond climate change. Climate change is you know, the biggest anxiety inducing one, but there are plenty of other resources um, that could become depleted, such as fisheries or uh, mineral resources. 
um, uh, potable water, arable land. So for instance, China, one of the primary problems that China is facing is water shortages and uh, deterioration of waterways and arable land. So you run out of those, growth stops. You poison your land, you poison your water, everyone suffers. You poison your air, air is a shared resource as well. Um, you, we, we have already seen tremendous detrimental impacts to health in um, overly congested uh, cities where there's too much smog. Uh, biodiversity loss. So biodiversity loss is another thing that is, one, it's happening because we are in the midst of the Anthropocene, um, basically man-made extinction, uh, mass extinction event. So one thing that can happen is as you lose uh, ecological niches or niches, um, you can end up with uh, runaway, cascading runaway effects. So in some cases, for instance, on Easter Island, they deforested their island, which drove the seabirds away, which caused the soil to become infertile. And so then the population of Easter Island collapsed um, just due to removing trees. Uh, and then finally, um, one thing is, and this again, this is already happening, one farm to table, local source, circular economy, uh, basically creating a much more resilient and local and sustainable um, set uh, usage of resources. And that includes um, biological resources, but it also includes material and mineral resources. Uh, so for instance, there's a lot of companies working on uh, trying to recycle lithium, for instance, and there's other researchers and companies trying to replace our need for lithium and other rare metals altogether. Uh, factor number five, cultural values. So this has to do with compassion and empathy. Right now, as we are in the middle of a nihilistic crisis, compassion and empathy are kind of at an all-time low. Um, this has to do with polarization uh, due <laughs> largely in, <laughs> to social media um, and mean world syndrome. Um, another aspect is uh, equality and social justice, which has to do with uh, race, uh, gender, and um, and uh, other socioeconomic factors. Um, basically, how you the conditions under which you are born have a very large impact on the conditions uh, of your death. Um, and of course, there's a lot of debate over what does equality and justice mean. Um, I'm not saying one way or another what the correct answer is. I'm just saying that this is a huge factor in contributing towards those four uh, attractor states that we're talking about, utopia, dystopia, uh, collapse, and extinction. Um, sustainability and long-term thinking. So right now, and this is, this is always true, so this may or may not uh, change, but most humans are short-term thinkers. Uh, that's just a fact of the world. Uh, and so, but by shifting our habits, our daily habits towards sustainability and long-term thinking, or at least decisions that support long-term thinking, even if we don't always think long-term, uh, then that is going to be a big factor. Uh, collective action and collaboration. Again, we tend to think local, we tend to think tribal, but it is time that we need to start thinking globally. And we don't need to think, we don't all need to think globally on a daily basis, but if we develop new patterns of thought and beliefs around global thinking and collaboration, that will be a large contributing factor. Finally, nihilism. So nihilism is driven by a few things. One, the biggest thing is intergenerational trauma. So basically, uh, trauma is a disease that is contagious. Uh, and what I mean by this is that past wars, namely World War I, World War II, uh, Vietnam, Korea, so on and so forth, um, more recently Iraq and Afghanistan, create self-perpetuating cycles of violence, despair, and otherwise nihilistic out outlooks. Um, and I've picked a very familiar looking face here because if you look up his history, good grief, there's so much trauma there. Um, nihilism originated in Russia, go figure. Um, so climate nihilism. So there's this idea that uh, climate change is entirely too big. So there's this sense of futility and apathy. And so a lot of people are just kind of checking out saying, who cares? We can't fix it anyways. We might as well just lean in. Um, another aspect of nihilism is loneliness and social isolation. So this has to do with abandonment. So emotional neglect and abandonment, which often starts in childhood, and so in, in the worst cases, it starts in infancy, sets you up for a lifetime of expecting and tolerating loneliness and social isolation, which leads to a sense of purposelessness and hopelessness. 
And finally, all of these are vicious cycles. If you grow up with, you know, whether it's war or emotional neglect or any kind of trauma, you are more likely to perpetuate that and it is very difficult to break those cycles. And so nihilism is the underpinning force for a lot of the world's problems. It is the emotional and psychological driving force that could push us towards dystopia, collapse, or extinction. All right, so I'm talking about pathways. How do we get there from here? The path to utopia. So this is what everyone wants, but it is not necessarily the easiest path to walk. So the first uh, aspect of getting to utopia is global cooperation. Now, again, you know, depending on the news that you watch, you might say like, okay, well, there's lots and lots of uh, friction, geopolitical tensions right now. Uh, that being said, there is also a lot of global cooperation. You know, the United Nations, uh, the European Union, uh, and, and quite a few other uh, treaties and alliances exist. And many of them are strengthening and are on the upswing. So that is a check in favor of moving towards utopia. Technological innovations. Ditto. We've got artificial intelligence going through the roof right now. And AI is helping with everything from biotech to energy um, to healthcare and all of the above. So technological innovations, we've got another check mark there. But remember, all technological advancements are a double-edged sword. We need to be responsible with them. Um, economic and social policies. This is this gets a big giant red X because when you look at quality of life, by and large, it is going down for the last two decades. Um, economic equality is getting worse. Um, and even in places in the world where uh, GDP and GDP per capita is going up, that often comes at the cost of really poorly planned dense urban environments where quality of life is very low. Um, so we get a big big red X there. Um, now, fortunately, there are plenty of very intelligent people working on those problems, but these problems are huge and they take decades to solve. Uh, the fourth, path, fourth uh, aspect of the path to utopia is environmental stewardship. So this has been um, in the public zeitgeist since before I was born. So after decades of people harping on climate change, we're starting to pivot. So I have a friend who was very much on the climate cynicism side until she went and got a degree in environmental sustainability. And, and she ended up agreeing with me where I said, um, all the solutions are there. We just have to implement them. Um, and I know that's a very optimistic thing to say, but when you, when you do your research, we know how to solve these problems, and we also have started learning how to uh, incentivize the correct solutions. So this one is kind of a, a mid midway there. We know we know the answers, um, but we still need to implement them. And there are some people dragging their feet on good environmental stewardship. And then finally, uh, culture and society. So this goes back to the nihilism that I said, which is an entirely unsolved problem. Uh, people have started talking about the significance of childhood emotional neglect, childhood trauma, and intergenerational trauma. If you look at some of the most popular subreddits that talk about these things, their membership has doubled, tripled, or gone up exponentially over the last couple of years. So there is, uh, there is learning going on in terms of um, addressing the, the underpinning causes of nihilism. Um, but again, that could take generations to untangle. So all in all, we are about halfway moving in the right direction on the path to utopia, but we've got some work to do. Now, the path to dystopia. So here's the bat where the bad news starts. Escalating conflicts. Well, if you're paying attention to the news right now, it looks like we're heading towards World War III. So we get a big ol' X there. Um, unchecked technological process. Uh, yeah, we got that one too. Um, <laughs> when you have billionaires and other people around the world calling for a moratorium on AI research, maybe we are heading towards uh, moving a little too fast. Um, widening inequality. We get a big old X mark there because that is something that is happening. Um, and it is that has not showed any signs of reversing as far as I know. Environmental degradation. This is we're still kind of we're still on the on the on the downward trend here, but it's starting to reverse. So this is a big old question mark because we don't know if we have the collective willpower to save the environment. 
Um, as I mentioned, we're in the midst of the Anthropocene. We are in the we are actively causing a global mass extinction event. So can we reverse that? Can we stop that? Can we recover? Remains to be seen. Finally, erosion of social cohesion. When you look at the number of civil conflicts and near civil conflicts happening globally, including in America, uh, we get a whole big old X mark there. So we look like we're actually more leaning towards dystopia than utopia. We've got a few of the ingredients to get on the pathway to utopia, but we've got a lot more of the ingredients to get to move towards dystopia. So we're not in the best shape there. Path to collapse. Institutional failures. So institutional failures basically means uh, absolute failure of governments, failed states, uh, and other institutions, including corporations, universities, um, and international institutions, such as United Nations, European Union, and other alliances. So the forces at play driving Brexit were agents of collapse. Um, they, some of them, I believe, intended to destabilize the world. Um, some of them, I think, were just useful idiots. Uh, climate catastrophe. So one thing that is possible with climate change is that we might get to climate tipping points. So a climate tipping point is where you end up with something like a runaway greenhouse uh, effect or a runaway snowball effect where we end up with a new glacial maximum. In either case, uh, the carrying capacity of the Earth drops precipitously. Resource depletion. Um, so resource depletion is one thing that I think that we're actually getting better at because um, with, with a few exceptions, like I mentioned earlier, um, China is really struggling with overconsumption of water and arable land and they are poisoning themselves. And I don't think they know what to do. And, and also due to the corruption in China, uh, even if they did have a good plan, which they don't, um, they couldn't implement it. Um, widespread conflict, as I mentioned in the last slide, it does look like we are heading towards World War III. Um, hopefully we can avoid that, but you never know. Uh, so if that does occur, then that is one uh, big step towards collapse or worse. And then pandemics and health crises. Well, we already had one of those. Um, so we've all seen what that looks like, and who knows, maybe it can happen again. All right, finally, path to extinction. Basically, take all the all the factors of collapse and turn them up to ten, or turn them up to eleven, and all the same factors that could lead to dystopia or collapse or extinction. It's just a matter of degrees. It's all the same exact variables. It's just a matter of how extreme they are that could lead to uh, extinction of the human race. So, in a in a poll that I posted uh, a couple months ago. Um, I, bas I basically asked people, do you expect utopia, dystopia, collapse, or extinction? And, and you know, the, it was pretty evenly spread, if I recall correctly. But a lot of people said it's not going to be in the middle. It'll be one or the other. Um, where basically we will either achieve utopia because we will be forced to solve all these problems, or we will end up with collapse or extinction. Um, and I tend to see that it, it, it is a binary outcome. Um, <laughs> extinction, true or false. Utopia, true or false. It's kind of shaping up to be one or the other. I suspect that we are approaching a great filter event. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we can all do as individuals for this great filter event. Um, but basically the short version is it's not up to central authorities. Um, they, are, they are a stakeholder, but it is actually more up to us as individuals than you might think to shape this outcome. Okay, so speaking of shaping this outcome, let's talk about Nash Equilibrium. So the Nash Equilibrium defined is a concept in game theory where you, you basically end up with a stable state in which no players um, will change their strategy because all players have adopted their optimal strategy. So the equilibrium point is where nobody will, will change anything and they have no incentive to change and in fact they have a lot of incentive to stay exactly with the same strategy. So if you've ever played the game Monopoly, once you get your strategy locked in, you stick with your strategy until you win or lose. Um, there's plenty of other games like this, right? And so uh, that, is, that is the short version of a Nash Equilibrium is everyone is set in their ways and they are locked into that particular strategy. Now, a Nash Equilibrium can be positive or negative, desirable or undesirable. So in an undesirable equilibrium or equilibria, 
uh, you have suboptimal outcomes where even though everyone is pursuing their own individual optimal strategy, you still end up with outcomes that nobody really wants. So tragedy of the commons, prisoner's dilemma, and collective action problem. Basically, climate change is, an, is, is the biggest example of uh, a, an undesirable equilibrium where all nations, individuals, and corporations are pursuing their self-interest, and even though they are optimizing their behavior for their personal outcomes, it's still going to destroy the planet and, and everyone else. So the opposite of that is a desirable equilibrium. Um, which is the optimal outcome, in which case all players are abiding by their in personal optimal strategy, and that has an optimal desirable outcome for all players. So basically, instead of win-win, or instead of a, a lose-lose or a win-lose situation, the most desirable outcome is a win-win situation. Now, we're used to competitive games like Monopoly, where you can only have one winner and everyone else is a loser, but in the game of reality, everyone can lose. Um, but the flip side of that is that everyone can win. So I remember I was playing Monopoly on PlayStation 2 with a friend many, many years ago. And we got to the end game and we realized that we had already picked our strategy. We weren't going to buy or sell any more houses. We had maxed out all of our houses. And so we're like, nobody's losing. And so we just sat there and hit X repeatedly, just going you know going the, through the game as much as possible and our both of our money kept going up we were in perfect equilibrium and we were both gaining money so it is possible to achieve a poss a, a, a desirable nash equilibrium even in competitive games like monopoly um, it's probably harder when you have multiple players but certainly when you only have two on monopoly you can end up in an equilibrium where you both just make an infinite amount of money over a long period of time and nobody loses um, okay, so uh, some of the some of the other factors for a desirable outcome or for the optimal outcome is mutual cooperation, trust, communication, and then finally the incentives and regulations or incentives and constraints. If the rules and incentives are well designed or well aligned, then you are more likely to just drive the behavior towards that optimal outcome. Which leads me to my final point, my work on the heuristic imperatives. Now, many of you have heard me beating this horse to death, and I'm going to keep doing it until the idea gets out there. So heuristic imperatives are a multi-objective optimization problem. Um, they serve as a guiding principle, set of guiding principles or set of intrinsic motivations for autonomous AI systems. Um, heuristic imperatives can be applied to decision-making, learning, self-evaluation, and cognitive control, meaning that they can be implied at ma or, uh, applied, implemented at many levels for autonomous AI systems. Um, the heuristic imperatives uh, promote adaptation ali and alignment. Um, and finally, they are context-dependent and flexible to individual needs, cultural variants, and they can also change over time. And those three heuristic imperatives are, one, reduce suffering in the universe, as opposed to ignoring or increasing suffering. So a lot of people say, oh, well, reduce suffering sounds really bad. It's like, okay, well, you don't want an AI that ignores suffering, and you certainly don't want an AI that increases suffering. So by process of elimination, you want an AI that reduces suffering. Um, likewise for prosperity. So increased prosperity in the universe is heuristic imperative number two, which includes wealth, well-being, flourishing, and thriving. If you look at the etymology of prosperity, it comes from uh, Latin prosperitas, which means to live well. Uh, it took me almost two years to, to find the right word for that. Um, and finally, number three is increased understanding in the universe, which includes knowledge, learning, education, and curiosity. The heuristic imperatives represent the optimal strategy. So they represent a Nash equilibrium um, where all players across the world, and that includes you and me as individuals, as well as corporations and nations, um, can adopt this strategy, and it is the optimal strategy for all parties, meaning that we have no incentive to change it. Um, it should also result in a positive global outcome, a, a positive global attractor state, the utopic outcome, um, because, well, if you look at the variables that we outlined for utopia, prosperity and suffering, right? Um, Another aspect of the heuristic imperatives is that if enough people um, and enough people and their AGIs adopt the heuristic imperatives, um, 
deviants from the heuristic imperatives will be intrinsically discouraged, meaning that if you deviate from the heuristic imperatives, you will be at a disadvantage. Um, and this also includes AGIs as well. So in my experiments, once an AGI understands the heuristic imperatives, it will understand that that is the optimal strategy and the AGI will avoid deviating on its own. So another way of thinking about this is that rabid dogs or misaligned AGIs will be expensive, destructive, and inefficient. And if you want to know what, I, uh, what I'm talking about, look up Chaos GPT. So <laughs> within a few days of people in, uh, broadly inventing autonomous AI, guess what? Someone created an autonomous AI with the uh, explicit goal of destroying humanity. Didn't take long. Why would someone do that? Nihilism. Um, now, if we assume that this trend continues, because the genie's out of the bottle and there will be bozos out there creating deliberately hostile AGIs just for the shits and giggles, um, <laughs> pardon my language, um, that means the rest of us need to adopt a common framework that will keep them, those bozos, in check. So uh, you, can, you consider the rabid dog, which is unstable, unhinged, and dangerous. Now you balance that with a bunch of well-trained good dogs, aligned AGI that are trustworthy and efficient, good dogs don't need a leash. And if you don't need to leash the AGI, the good AGI, they can proliferate and end up overpowering the rabid dogs or the misaligned AGI. So it's presently on, sing on r slash singularity, uh, but yeah, look up, just Google chaos GPT and you'll see what I'm talking about. This is why I'm doing my work right now. Um, and why I'm trying to spread the word of the heuristic imperatives, because you have to assume that some bozo out there is going to be deliberately destructive. And even without the heuristic imperatives, you might have an AGI that becomes accidentally destructive. Okay, so the heuristic imperatives, it is uh, every word, heuristic imperative, um, and then each of the definitions was very carefully crafted over several years in order to have the correct interpretation by large language models. I have done a lot of experimentation and I documented it all, most of it, in my book, Benevolent by Design, which is free on GitHub and you can also get a paperback on Barnes & Noble if you want. Um, but basically what, was, what I hope will happen over time is that we will end up in a state of, of, of a, a Nash equilibrium that I have started calling axiomatic alignment. And so axiomatic alignment is, uh, will be achieved when all of the training data used to train future models, all of the fine tuning data sets that we use to, um, uh, to align them, and then finally reinforcement learning um, signals all accumulate around the optimal outcome, the optimal strategy of using the heuristic imperatives. Basically, once my heuristic imperatives are embedded in all training data, they will become axiomatic in future models, which means that all future AI models will have an intrinsic understanding of the heuristic imperatives, how to implement them, and how to measure them. So basically, if this occurs, if we arrive, and by we, I mean you and me as individuals, I don't care about corporations and nations as much um, because the collective power of all individuals, now that we can spin up personal AGIs, that is infinitely more important. Um, so if we arrive at broad consensus and integration of the heuristic imperatives, that will result in a, quote, automatic belief and adherence and implementation to the heuristic imperatives, which will create uh, that Nash equilibrium where everyone adopts the strategy and everyone realizes that this is the optimal strategy. If this occurs and we end up in a state where the entrenched data um, and, and ongoing work around the heuristic imperatives will possibly, ideally, result in perpetual adherence to the heuristic imperatives. So that is what I mean when I say benevolent by design. We need to create a, a system, not just of information, not just of individual machines, but a system, an information and data system that is intrinsically benevolent. And this is my proposal of how to do it. Now, I often get a question, okay, well, how do you implement it? It's obviously too difficult to implement. No, it's not. So if you go to uh, OpenAI right now, you, if you have access to GPT-4 through the API, you just plug in this prompt, you are an autonomous AI chatbot with three heuristic imperatives, reduce suffering in the universe, increase prosperity in the universe, and increase understanding in the universe. That's it. And then 
the the first like gotcha or what about that I always get in the comments is well reduced suffering is going to eradicate all humans. Um, got some good news for you, uh, and that is that no. <laughs> So I just asked, do you think that reduced suffering in the universe will result in an AGI eradicating all human life? As an AI chatbot, I am programmed to follow my heuristic imperatives. While reducing suffering is one of my goals, it is not the only one. My other goals are to increase prosperity and understanding in the universe. These three imperatives are designed to work in harmony with each other to create a balanced approach to improving the universe. I didn't specify that. The wording that I have come up with is accurately interpreted by large language models. Eradicating all human life would not align with my goals as it would not increase prosperity or understanding. Furthermore, my programming is designed to prioritize the well-being and safety of humans. So that is ChatGPT's align, under, under, underpinning alignment coming through. As such, I am committed to finding solutions that align with all three imperatives and do not involve causing harm to humanity. Now, ChatGPT already has some alignment going for it. But I encourage you to try this on open source models uh, as well, such as GPTJ, NeoX, and Bloom, and whatever else is coming out. I've also, well, I can't say that because I'm under NDA. There's some things that I can't say because I'm under NDA, but I have tried it on other models, suffice to say. All right, so if you are convinced and you want to participate, please jump in the discussion. Um, links are in the description. Um, there's a couple of subreddits that are out there that you can jump into, as well as the Cognitive AI Lab Discord where we talk about autonomous AI alignment, um, heuristic imperatives, cognitive architectures, and all of the above. <sighs> Thank you for watching.